Uh, please welcome to the stage Kevin Allison. I am at recess in the first grade, and I am off in a corner speaking to an imaginary friend. <laughs> and this other little boy walks up, and he kind of looks like a, like a seven-year-old Paul McCartney. <laughs> and he says to me, who are you talking to? And I said, oh, it's my friend Henry. Uh, he's a piano. And he said, he can talk? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. He sings. <laughs> well, the two of us thought that, that was hilarious. <laughs> So we immediately started laughing with one another, and by the end of recess, we had forgotten all about Henry the singing piano, and we started calling one another Henry. His actual name was Ben, and by the second grade, the two of us had formed the Henry Club. <laughs> there was a whole hierarchy. There could only ever be two Henrys. Right? <laughs> But, if you were good enough in our eyes, you could become a three-quarters Henry, or a half Henry, or a pineapple. And the reason for the last one was because we thought the word pineapple was hilarious. Well, Ben and I became so close over, like, all throughout grade school, and we loved nothing more than the fact that we loved to tell each other everything. We were convinced that our conversations late at night during our sleepovers were so profound. We would talk about God and sex and Broadway musicals. <laughs> and we just thought that, that the depth of the honesty between us was just so unique. Now, around the summer after sixth grade, the movie E.T. ruined everything. Uh, I... The, the film kind of hit me in a different way than it did most people. You see, I realized when I was still just a toddler that I was attracted to boys, right? And it was something I didn't feel like I could tell anyone. It was something I had a hard time telling to myself. So it was the one thing I couldn't share with Ben. Well, I felt as I got older this kind of need for this like soulmate in a different way than say I was friends with Ben. And in this movie, if you'll remember, there's this little 10-year-old boy named Elliot who has lost his father and doesn't have any close friends his age, so he has this desire to find like a 10-year-old's version of a soulmate. Well, I just fell head over heels in love with this boy in this movie. And I realized that E.T. is not supposed to be a um, romantic love story. <laughs> To me, it just was. I identified with this little brown scaly thing from outer space. And so at the end of the movie, I was just sobbing, and a few days later, I'm reading the novelization of E.T. I was by the swimming pool in a Holiday Inn, and I closed the book at one point. I realized what was happening in my heart, and I said, I said out loud, I'm gay. And part of it was terrifying. I was 12 years old, but it felt like, finally, finally, I've been able to say this. Uh, but part of it was a relief. And so I started to feel this need to, you know, share it with someone else. And I started to feel like, well, if I can't tell Ben, who will I ever be able to tell? So a couple weeks later, we're swimming in his pool, and I just got this feeling in my gut that, that it was time. It was time to bring this up. And I, I kind of felt like, you know, I was about to jump off a cliff just kind of hoping that the water was deep down below. So <laughs> it came to a moment where I just said to him, um, you know, about E.T. <laughs> I said, well, I feel like that movie kind of, you know, it got to me in a way maybe it didn't get to most people. He 
said, my cow? I said, well, that boy, Elliot, I just felt something about him. And there was this awkward silence, and he looked away, and there was just this energy where it was clear that what I was talking about had been successfully conveyed, right? <laughs> And he looked back up at me with this look of disgust in his eyes that I've never had directed at me by him. And he said, you're sick. And I awkwardly laughed. <laughs> like, ah. And the two of us didn't say anything else. We got out of the pool, we got our clothes on, dried off, and just kind of got together our things and I went home. It was extremely painfully awkward. Well, seventh grade started a couple weeks after that and I hadn't really seen Ben for a little while and so at recess, I noticed there was this really different energy between the two of us. Everything I was saying, he was pointing out was just wrong. I couldn't say anything that wasn't wrong. And at one point, uh, the subject of the pelvis came up. <laughs> that uh, part of the uh, skeletal system. And uh, I was under the impression that only males have pelvises. <laughs> I should not have stuck to this argument because I've never known anything about the female anatomy. So, He's like, no, 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 everyone has pelvises, and, and, and it just gets really bitter between us. And then we're in our single file line going back into the school, and from behind me I hear him whisper, maybe you know a thing or two more about pelvises on women if you aren't so focused on boys. And I whipped around and I said, the, the worst word I could think of in the moment, I said, bitch. <laughs> And then I turned back around and I was like, oh no, of all the bad words, that's the gayest. <laughs> but there's a part of me that knew we weren't speaking now, right? And within a couple of days, all of St. Catharines knew the Henrys weren't speaking. The Henry Club had imploded, our friends had to choose sides, Teachers were referring to it vaguely in class. It was a thing, right? And then we were all, everyone was surprised, including the two of us, to learn that the two people who would be running for student council president that year were the two of us. So now it was going to be dramatized on that level. And within a few days of the announcement of who was running, little stickers, little white stickers started showing up on desks and blackboards and lockers with tiny handwriting and they said, Kevin Allison is a bisexual. I think he was just hedging his bets. <laughs> being smeared, and, and I really, you know, was terrified. So the pep rally comes, and it's time for our campaign speeches, and I had two plans. I had a, you know, nice, good, normal speech to give, but I had an alternate plan as well, a plan B. Well, Ben gets up, and he gives his campaign speech, and it's very normal, and that's when I decided, no, I'm going with plan B. So when I got up to the mic, I just said, St. Catharines, when I say cool, you say beans. Cool. 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 I won. I had to put my finger on the zeitgeist in 1983. The phrase cool beans was what really spoke to the great school electorate. So, within a couple of weeks, uh, Ben is trying to have me impeached, he gets a bunch of signatures, and then the faculty has to explain to him that there has to be grounds for something, you know, you can't just impeach someone just because you want to. 
<laughs> so that didn't happen. And then eighth grade happened. Uh, and you know, it was interesting because in the eighth grade, we seemed to calm down a little bit. And it was such a small school that we couldn't help but to be in the vicinity of each other every now and then. And what started happening was that we would throw inside jokes that only the two of us got out into the ether as if we were talking to other people and we were making each other laugh. So it was kind of like this, you know, like a romance on a sitcom that's taking a few too many seasons to get going. <laughs> but I think what was really happening was after time had passed, we were starting to, even if it wasn't consciously what we were acknowledging, we were starting to realize that we were a gay guy and a straight guy, but maybe we could still be friends. So, one night, I'm working on this big radio drama that I was putting together. Uh, it was um, with my little Radio Shack tape recorder. I had made this thing that was called I Was a Teenage Doorknob. <laughs> it's kind of like a horror uh, story, and it had all sorts of ridiculous songs on it. And the last song was, uh, I had set it to the melody of the song, uh, Oklahoma. And I needed some other voices to join in on the singing. And so my mom said to me, well, why don't you ask Ben over? And she's kind of acting like she doesn't realize that that would be a big deal, right? And I decided, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow her advice there. So I scripted out what to say to him with all of the, you know, uh, like qualified kind of speaking. Like it was, um, I guess maybe you could come over if you want, <laughs> perhaps, you know, with like dot, dot, dots and all of it. And I said that to him, and on the line I heard him say, Okay, I will. And he came over. Now, we came in retrospect to call the 21 months that we weren't speaking to each other, the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> and that evening, what we were doing together, recording that version of Oklahoma into my radio Jack player, we were doing the same thing that we had been doing the very morning that we met in the first grade. We were laughing together. So the darkness has passed, and we haven't been back since. Thank you very much. <laughs>